I was born in uh, Yonkers, New York. Yonkers, New York is only famous for George Gershwin's line, who cares what they say in Yonkers as long as you've got the kiss that conquers. That is the only thing that people remember about the word Yonkers, I'm afraid. But it was very useful that once you grew up and were interested in becoming an actress in the theater, that it was so near New York that I could commute. I could go back and forth on the subway and the trolley car at, the, at that time the, when I was very young. Yonkers was a kind of suburb of New York. My father, my father died when I was two, and my mother had uh, three children. I had an older sister and a younger brother. She had a family uh, in Brooklyn when I was very young, I guess maybe like, you know, maybe two and a half, something like that. We moved to Brooklyn, and uh, we stayed there for about, uh, I guess, till I was eight. Uh, and then there was a lot of a lot of moving around for a couple of years. But then we settled, we moved back to Yonkers, I guess when I was about 12. And I finished junior high school and high school in Yonkers. And then of course, you know, all the professional things started very young. My given name was Lillian Perry Miller. And Perry was my father's name. So that after he died, they gave it to me as a middle name because my brother already was named after an uncle. But when I went into the theater, which was when I was about 16, uh, I became Perry Miller. People remembered that name because there was a big show that was uh, Perry Mason. So they would make the connection, <laughs> they could remember, they could remember Perry. My family was not involved in, in theater or the arts at all. Uh, my mother came with her family, uh, when she was eight years old, she came from what was then part of Russia, but it was actually uh, Poland. But I was interested in acting very, very young. I was always entertaining. I mean, I was the one, they told me when I was about two or three years old, I would perform something for a, a little family group and then says, why, do, why don't you craft for me? <laughs> so that, uh, I guess, you know, you're kind of born with that. When I went into school, you know, I was doing uh, in the dramatic club. We did a lot of theatrical things in camp, you know, that shows, amateur theatricals. And then as I got a little older, I joined um, uh, a little theater group in Yonkers. There was a thing called, at that time, they called them amateur hours in the 30s, all the uh, vaudevillians and actors were out of work. And so they started something in movie theaters that they called amateur hours, that they could have acts, different acts. And they had one that was open to people in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, so when they came to Yonkers, uh, myself and a friend of mine uh, signed up. Uh, I ended up winning the prize and making five dollars. Well, five dollars, you realize this, that that's a lot of money. Somebody said to me, Perry, you know, you could do this if you wanted to. You know, there's a place downtown in New York, uh, in the Bond Building, and why don't you go and uh, you could make some money. And of course, my mother was horrified, you know, coming home late at night, but I started doing that, and I did, had a kind of circuit so I got on Major Bowe's Amateur Hour, which was a big deal at that time. And a result of that, I guess I was one of the prize winners, but I, uh, you got an audition with a real radio show. And I got an audition and I did, uh, 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 and I did one or two, got $75 for an hour. $75 an hour, can you imagine at that time? You know, it was a fortune. So I decided, that there's no question. I always wanted to be an actress, and it was this was my, you know, the theater was my was my was my destiny, and um, so that summer, uh, I decided I should become an apprentice with a summer stock company. That that was a thing to do in the summer, and uh, it cost I don't remember exactly, but you know it was a little expensive, 
And um, my mother, fortunately, when my father had died, had left uh, a couple of small little apartment houses. My mother turned out to be a good businesswoman. I had just finished my junior year in high school. It turned out that the, um, the apprentices did their own version of what, the, uh, uh, what the, the professionals were doing. You had a Saturday afternoon show. And it turned out uh, I was playing the lead. It was called Goodbye Again. And the leading lady went to New York, took off with the leading man, and didn't show up in time. And there they were, Saturday night, and no leading lady. Well, of course, I knew all the lines. <laughs> So I did, I did the lead with the professional company, and that did it. I mean, you know, nothing else had a chance. That summer, when, I, when we finished, I came back in the fall, and I began making the rounds of casting auditions. And somebody said, you know, they're looking for girls who look like you at the Theatre Guild. They're doing a show called Madame Bovary. So, of course, I ran over and they give you some lines to read. And I think as an actress, I had talent. I was, not, I was not a great talent, but I had enough talent. I would say I was pretty good. Anyway, I got the part, and it was a speaking part, and I had to join Actors' Equity. It was six months. You see, the Theatre Guild had uh, subscription audiences. So if you signed up, if you got in a Theatre Guild show, you had six months of sure work. So I took six months off from high school. And uh, so I missed the first six months of my senior year. But I was a very, I'll be very immodest, and I was a very, very good student. And um, uh, so I managed to graduate with my class, second in my class. That bothered me. I mean, I intended to graduate first, but I managed to graduate second. And, um, uh, and then, and that was it. As I said, I told my teachers that I'm, I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to be, I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to the theater. And, um, and then I found out what it was like. You know, I had gotten a part the very first time. You know, it was so easy. And then I found out that it was very tough. But I did manage to get some small parts. Once I began seriously looking for a job, and I told my mother, that I wanted to, to move to New York. Well, that was a shanda. That's in Yiddish, that's a shame. I mean, that is really, uh, a, really a disgrace if your, your unmarried young daughter moves to New York. That is, you know, is not considered, uh, uh, that's not, mothers are not, <laughs> mothers are not happy about that. And uh, so it was kind of resolved by the fact that I had a cousin, uh, 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 my cousin Molly, that she, uh, uh, that she was also looking for a place in New York. And uh, so we took, I remember, an apartment in Chelsea. If you're going to be an actress, you're going to have to support yourself somehow. And uh, the obvious thing was, at that time, uh, uh, to be a model. As a matter of fact, more people more girls maybe wanted to be models than, than actresses. So that I uh, had to have some photographs made. And then this, <laughs> this atmospheric uh, bathing suit picture. And I had a few minor uh, advertising job, very minor. But I did find that photographers, so-called art, art photographers, uh, liked photographing me. So I have... Uh, so I have a number of, of, of things which are kind of uh, their idea of being uh, arty, like, uh, like, like, like this one, you know, kind of um, atmospheric. And, and one of the things that began happening was that uh, uh, there were shorts being made. They were called soundies. And so I was, a, uh, I was an extra. And this, and this is one of my favorites. This, uh, I was a whack. I wrote the, uh, the words and the music for, the, for this. She has eyes of navy blue and a great big job to do. She's the niece of Uncle Sam and, you know, all this saluting. Um, and this was the way, 
sigh, sigh, this is the way I looked in my early 20s. I never wanted to do anything except be an actress. And then, and then the world changed. The world changed, fascism in Germany, in Italy, and um, I began to understand what was going on, and gradually I began to feel that um, if, I, if I was not an actress, there were a lot of other very good people who were going to play those parts as well or better than I. But maybe there were some things, maybe there were some things that needed to be done that if I didn't do them, maybe they wouldn't be done. Maybe there were some things that I could do uh, that mattered. And so I decided, you know, since theater was the only thing I really knew and was interested in, that I got the idea of Stage for Action to present short plays that dealt with important social and political issues at that time. And uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't get these things in professional, you know, uh, for nobody was going to pay to see them. They were, uh, so we were doing it for community audiences. So we did it for churches, for labor unions, for all kinds of community organizations. We asked some of the leading playwrights of the time, and Arthur Miller did one for us. We had some of the best actors on Broadway at that time. Uh, Sam Wanamaker w w was in it, and one of the shows was about the, um, the need for, for nurseries for the children of working mothers, because mothers were needed for war work at that time. This is all, all during the war. And uh, we had one on the Wagner Marie Dingo Bill, which was the same almost the same health bill that, um, uh, that Clinton tried to pass, that uh, Obama is trying to pass, and that stage for action grew out of this need to do something, something that would be important for the war effort. After the war, then things began, there were other issues, and it was then that I became interested in film. I know exactly when it happened. Uh, I went to the Museum of Modern Art to see Frank Capra's Why We Fight series. And at that time, it was still during the war that they were showing it. The whole series was created to tell soldiers to motivate why they were fighting, why it was worth risking their lives. And um, I'll, never, I'll never forget, you know, seeing uh, the first film and the emotional effect of this film uh, was so powerful that if there had been, I have said this and, and, and I think it's true, that if there had been somebody, a recruiter that signed you up when you came up, and I was such an intense pacifist, you know, such a, against the war. You know, all of us were against war until, you know, until fascism. Um, that that I would have become, uh, God help me, I, <laughs> I, I, I would have signed up. Because it was, uh, the, I, I realized the, the power of the film medium. And I found out that there was a tremendous field of a 16 millimeter film, which were reaching the same audiences that I had been trying to reach with Stage for Action, which was all kinds of community audiences and in schools and in colleges, libraries, uh, community groups, unions, churches, everywhere. Uh, uh, and that I decided I had to learn about 16 millimeter distribution. I didn't say I want to learn how to make 16 millimeter films. I wanted to learn about 16 millimeter distribution, how you got the films out there. And then, of course, I had to learn about what films existed. And I found out that um, Tom Brandon was, uh, uh, was the person who had the best library of, uh, uh, of let's say, social activist films. <laughs> so I went to Tom, and here is this, you know, sort of 
pretty gorgeous theatrical character coming into him and saying, I would like to work for you uh, for free because I'd like to learn the business. Well, he was no dope. So of course, you know, what did he have to lose? So I began working for Tom and trying to learn the business. I was working on a catalog of films and they were gonna be very widely distributed, some of the best films on um, social and political issues. And I found out that Tom only wanted to include Brandon films. And I said, well, what about this film and what about that film? Oh, no, 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 just, uh, I mean, I can't push somebody else's film. That was the end of the romance. Tom, Brandon, and I were finished. Well, actually, at that time, I found out that they were looking, yes, that was, they were looking for somebody at the UN who knew something about, um, uh, about 16 millimeter films, about non-theatrical films. <laughs> and, and it was very easy to get the job because there, weren't, there weren't much, wasn't much competition. There weren't many people in the field who were interested. And um, uh, so I made, it was called, uh, it was actually a supplement, but it was a big, thick catalog of uh, what they called social welfare films. And then I had gotten myself married a couple of years before this, and uh, for various reasons that began to fall apart. I'd always wanted to go to France. I always wanted to go to Europe. And this was my chance. I knew that this was the time to do it. And so in 1949, in September, I went first class on the Ile de France. And when I got on the boat, I really could not speak French. I couldn't understand. I went to a movie and I walked out because I couldn't really understand what was going on. I refused to talk English with anybody. I refused to talk English. And so I was practicing while I was on the boat and I was talking French. And I was very lucky because very close friends, V and Lothar Wolf, were in Paris. They were living in Paris. And Lothar, Lothar was the head of the film section of the Marshall Plan, so that he was the head of supporting film industry and documentary production, both feature and doc in, in, the, in the countries um, which had survived the war, which needed help. But in any case, I fell in love with Paris immediately, and I'm still in love with Paris. And, and looking back, that was an absolutely magical time. Uh, for one thing, um, uh, I had friends there so that I never felt alone. I never felt, well, you know, I don't know anybody here. I never felt I was in a strange town. Uh, my French uh, uh, was good enough so that uh, after a short time, uh, I could speak French uh, and I could, uh, I could communicate with, with, with people. And I met some wonderful people at UNESCO, and I became part of that kind of UNESCO crowd. And during that 10 months, uh, I saw all these wonderful short uh, or long, mostly short documentary films on all subjects. And that was a, a, very, uh, a very key point, moment in my life when we all went uh, there was the first International Festival of Films on Art. The first, very first, and it was in, in Brussels, the first International Festival of Films on Art where I saw the films of Luciano Emmer. And Luciano Emmer, who is in the art film field, the famous name, and I don't know how many people in America have heard of the name, but he was the first person to move a camera in close to works of art and tell the story of, uh, of the painting through uh, movement and close-ups. It was a revelation, I mean, a real revelation. I had never seen anything like it before. And then th there were other, other films. I mean, there were, uh, there were films on music, you know, wonderful films on music. And when we, I came back 
to Paris, I thought something has to be done about this. And I was looking for a cause, I guess. You know, I was Joan of Arc looking for a cause um, at that time. And, um, and I decided that it had to be a nonprofit organization, because there's not going to be any money in this, and that I would get together a group of uh, the best uh, documentaries on the arts and also scientific films, it's, uh, uh, all different kinds of documentary of producers who wanted, who would give me their films and wanted their films distributed in America. Their films were just not being shown uh, anywhere. I decided the way, how would I choose the best films? So I got a list from my friends um, of uh, who are the experts, who really knows about film besides Beside, you know, give me a list of what you think of the 10 of the best European documentaries that you think are worth bringing to America. And I got, a, I don't remember how many lists, maybe about 15 or 20 lists. The top of the list, everyone said Jacques-Yves Cousteau's films. Well, I had to be. So then I had to go to each one of the producers and say, this is what I intend to do. Your film has been chosen, and would you like to do it? And as of course, I, I said, what do they have to lose? So they said yes. Anyway, I came back to America. By this time, it's summer of 1950, and I decide to create Film Advisory Center. Well, I know if you want to do something, it's much easier to get the top people involved if it's, if it's something worthwhile than it is, you know, a second or third le level. And of course, Robert Flaherty was the great documentary character. And I went to see Bob. He became the, uh, the chairman of Film Advisory Center. And I began to put, to put together this advisory group that would make the selection of the films. So I had I started Bosley Crowther, who was the critic, film critic for the New York Times, uh, Aline Lockheim, who was the art critic for the New York Times, uh, Theodore Russo Jr., who was the top uh, curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Theodore Russo Jr., um, Arthur Knight, who was the critic, uh, film critic for the Saturday Review of Literature, you know, just marvelous people. And Robert Flaherty himself paid for the first screening of films for this group. And we invited people from Life magazine. And Aline did a full page, front page of the Sunday New York Times about Film Advisory Center and all of the European films. After the screening, Life magazine did six color pages of Jacques-Yves Cousteau's films. And so the next thing you know, Omnibus called us, and he got on Omnibus and did uh, 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 films for, uh, showed some of his films on Omnibus. Uh, RKO Pathé was interested. I mean, all these things began happening. Um, 16 millimeter distributors were interested, and we managed to place uh, all of the best films all got placed. How much money they made, I don't know. <laughs> but I know, but I paid for bringing them in and I got 10% of whatever it was. And I was doing this uh, and everybody thought I was crazy. As a matter of fact, my brother-in-law, <laughs> may his soul rest in peace, he always thought I was crazy. He said, what are you doing all this? You're always a volunteer. You know, you're always a volunteer, you know, aren't you ever gonna make, aren't you ever gonna make a living? And this, this is a shot of the first international festival of films on art in America at Woodstock, New York. These are the organizers. It's now become a relic, but the 16 millimeter film projector was very, very important at this, at this time. If the question is, 
did I ask myself, you know, could I do this or why am I doing this? I don't think so. I think that I just saw, you know, what was needed and that it was an opportunity to do something that would be worthwhile and it would be interesting. And if I believed in something, I could convince other people. I was really a wonderful salesman, but a salesman of ideas. But this is what created my career, because through these contacts, I began to know people, and that's how I met Perry Wolf. Perry Wolf was one of the top producers at CBS. He became very interested in some of the films that I had. Of course, television had become an important outlet an important place that, uh, that might be interested in showing the films. CBS at that time, you know, had the most wonderful uh, documentary uh, department. So I decided that, uh, that it was important to, to try to get people working in television interested, and that's how I met uh, Perry Wolf. I was invited out of gratitude for what I had done for French films and Italian films, the French government invited me to the Cannes Festival as a, as a guest, a week in Paris as a guest, and uh, the Italian government uh, offered me a week, uh, a week in Rome and a week at the Venice Festival. But how was I going to get there? I mean, they didn't send me any money. So I went to see Perry Wolf, and I said, Perry, I need some money. I've been invited to Europe. And I went to RKO Pathé. Uh, Bud Benjamin was there with the head of it at that time. And uh, Amos Vogel at Cinema 16 gave me $100. Perry gave me a couple of hundred, I forget exactly how much, enough to get me to Europe. And so I went to the Cannes Festival, but the section of the festival which dealt with documentaries and to the Venice Festival, and I wrote my critique, my reviews of all the documentaries that I thought were worthwhile that I saw, and I sent them to Perry Wolf, and I sent them to Bud Benjamin and Amos to some extent. And then Perry Wolf came to Paris that year um, and uh, said he would like to meet with me in, in Paris. and. Um, uh, he said, you know, I, was, uh, uh, I liked very much what you did, and we really need a film researcher, and uh, uh, I'd like you to come and work for me. And I said, but I don't know anything about television. And he said, you don't, you don't have to know anything about television. We need somebody who knows something about film, and uh, we'd like you to do it. 